Thank you, Professor Dimleitner. Next, we have uh, Ms. Ann Ravel. She is currently a lecturer at UC Berkeley School of Law, and she uh, was appointed by President Obama to the Federal Election Commission, where she later served as the chairwoman of the commission. Now, many of you may not think or immediately have campaign finance come to mind when you think of barriers at the ballot box, but a possible new form of voter suppression may be occurring right now. So please help me welcome Ms. Ann Ravel. So I really have to thank Sean and the other members of the Law Review because I was the biggest pain ever. Uh, no, I was because I hate footnotes. And <laughs> they told me I had to do hundreds of them. So just be known, this is not going to have any citations. <laughs> just want you to know that. And it, it, yes, people usually don't think about voting issues in concert with campaign finance issues, but I think pretty clearly they are related. And not only campaign finance issues with regard to voter suppression, but also many other things. And so I'm going to it, you know, in interest also of time, just going to start going through a number of them because when people think about voter suppression per se, they usually think about either what happened after Reconstruction because they had to deal with uh, the Constitutional 15th Amendment, uh, which allowed African-American men to vote, and so they had to come up with all those statutes that um, will um, prohibit people from voting, and you've heard today about a lot of voter suppression that and the laws and the unbelievable number of laws that have been introduced in state legislatures all over the country to try to uh, create a greater uh, environment of voter suppression. But there are so many other things that I think we need to talk about, and, and I know I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I also think it was mentioned in the discussion about gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is one of the things that also does have the impact of preventing people to vote. But in many cases, I actually think that this is just as purposeful as some of the statutes that have been enacted. Um, I, I think it, um, if, you, if you think about campaign finance system to begin with, um, we know uh, from polling and from, from a lot of other um, information that is out in the public and what people say, um, that the campaign finance system in our country has caused an amazing um, lowering of trust in government and trust in government institutions. Um, and it is also known that because the fairness of campaigns and the extreme um, ability of certain individuals to have a lot more influence in the electoral process and in elections generally, um, it often results and and people have said this in, in when asked about why they don't vote, um, with much less participation in the political process. Many people say that because of the campaign finance system and the laws and the policies, their representatives are bought and paid for by the wealthy long before the elections. And a lot of people do stay away from the polls because of that. A common reason that they cite for not voting is the view that a, that a majority of Americans have, poll after poll, um, that government is run solely for special interests. Only two in 10 Americans, um, and this was a, a poll that was done um, in 2018, believe that the government is run for the benefit of all Americans. And a two, 2017 poll, showed that 75% of Americans feel voiceless and powerless in the United States, including, and that it, there is rare unanimity on that response, not just Democrats, but Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Um, and um, many also 
it also, you know, cuts across uh, economic, racial, and geographic lines. And it also includes people who support President Trump and people who do not support Tr President Trump. Um, many of them say in this poll that they have too little influence or say over the decisions that are made by elected officials. And also in polling, most Americans say that they favor limits on the amount of money that individuals and organizations can spend on campaigns and that they definitely want to change the campaign finance system. The response of many people is not to, to um, decide not to go out to vote, but um, younger and less educated voters say that they are skeptical of the usefulness of voting, um, that it will have any influence whatsoever on government policy. Half of those who aren't actually trying to be educated or learning about um, elections uh, feel that their vote doesn't matter. Uh, and Poor Americans, percentage-wise, um, may not even, according to the statistics, register because they think that government isn't looking out for their interests and that their vote doesn't count. And in fact, the suspicion that their vote has little influence on federal policy is actually true. Um, there were studies by um, professors Gillen, Gillen and Page uh, who ha had their uh, staff do an analysis of every federal law, every federal public, every federal policy and regulation. And based on that analysis, uh, they determined that corporate and wealthy interests affect government policy, and at one point they had a percentage to this, and it was something like 98% of the policies, whereas the average American voter has little or no influence. And um, on this same topic, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Joseph Stiglitz has reiterated that exact same fact, um, where he correlates the influence of money in politics um, with severe economic inequality. And he concludes, and this is his quote mostly, there is no magic bullet to remedy a problem as deep-rooted as America's inequality. Its origins are largely political, so it is hard to imagine any meaningful change without a concerted effort to take money out of politics through, for instance, campaign finance reform. Um, and that article, for those of you who are interested, was in the uh, Scientific American. So it has science behind it. Um, but because um, campaign finance laws and Supreme Court decisions allow unlimited amounts of money to be spent in campaigns as independent expenditures, uh, the courts have struck down all the limits uh, to these independent expenditure committees. And that, um, after Citizens United um, also, which uh, was essentially um, about corporations and in both uh, for business corporations as well as uh, nonprofit corporations and unions, um, it permitted unlimited money in the in the system, which essentially ushered in the inequality of campaign contributions by allowing this unlimited amount of money from the wealthy. We know that participation in elections allows people to, you know, sort of shape policy decisions that affect their lives. But when a very small number of people are the ones who are contributing to campaigns, uh, as occurred in the last eight years when only 11 donors gave $11 billion, or $1 billion to elections, 
Um, and in the 2018 uh, midterm elections, super PACs, where a small number of donors were giving an enormous amount of money, actually spent more money uh, than either the parties or the candidates themselves in the election. Uh, so all of these things lead to disincentive for people to vote. Um, and another part of the campaign finance system that is really important that also leads to that view for people that they do not want to vote has to do with the fact that there is so much what's called dark money now in the system and the ability to funnel money, whether it's be, it is that you give to a super PAC and then they funnel it through a 501c4 that doesn't have to disclose their donors, um, it definitely has been found also um, through polling that it impacts the desire of people to vote. The, the political donors who want to keep their identity uh, anonymous can do that very easily in our system, and it's obviously not the people who are con contributing directly to the candidates. Um, this not only deprives people of the information that they need in order to vote, because it's often that people look at who it is that's supporting candidates to make a decision about whether or not they're going to support them, but Independent expenditures have had, a, a, and people were talking about polarization and negativity, they have had a much greater impact on that than just about anything else in our political system because since there is no individual that has to be accountable for those ads, they tend to be polarizing, they tend to be extreme, they tend to be vitriolic, and they always attend, or seem to be false. So that kind of, of political campaigning is something that has caused many people to tune out. I know I once uh, went on a listening tour when I was at the FEC, and actually I was in Colorado, and several people, they were then going through a campaign, and there was so much of this vitriol, and people were disgusted and said that they really didn't feel because of this system that they even wanted to participate. They just wanted to tune out. Um, so, and that, while that's anecdotal, there's also been a lot of polling on that same um, issue. And then uh, we have to get to the Federal Election Commission where um, uh, Mr. Spakovsky this morning was on it for a few minutes and <laughs> I spent um, three and a half years there. The Federal Election Commission is a really important commission intended to, in fact it says in its, um, on the website, uh, that the idea is to reduce the amount of money in the electoral process to assure that there's fairness and integrity in the political process. Well, the Federal Election Commission that consists of six members, no more than three of one political party, since um, Don McGahn, who was subsequently White House counsel, devised a really good scheme. And by the way, Don McGahn said when he was um, on the Federal Election Commission, I don't enforce the law as Congress intended it. I plead guilty as charged. He said that publicly. How do you think that affects people's sense that there is a commission that is intended to uh, create um, fairness in the electoral process um, and it doesn't? Uh, how do you think people think about the process? Well, what they think is most of the um, politicians who know that the commission isn't going to do anything because it requires four votes and so they don't enforce the law, they don't do regulations, uh, they at least, if they chose not to enforce a particular matter, I could understand it, but they actually choose not even to investigate a lot of things. And because of this and because of um, some of the other issues like the dark money, uh, that has enabled 
Russian interference in our election and money that's obviously spent circuitously in campaigns, and we'll probably learn more about that as the Mueller indictments come out. Um, but it's notable that all the Mueller indictments so far are about campaign finance, so this is a really sexy topic now. That it wasn't when I was there, but <laughs> it is now. But so these are issues that cause people to have a lot less uh, trust in our governmental processes when they know that the commissions that, the, that are actually captured and are not doing what they're supposed to do. But I, I also want to talk a little bit about some other things that happened in, um, particularly, speaking of Mueller, particularly in the 2016 election, but is also happening in the 2018 election, or happened in the 2018 election. And that's the issue of micro-targeting, uh, because uh, micro-targeting has been an activity that's been done for quite a long time with campaigns. And uh, people talked about it being perfected in the Obama campaign. Uh, micro-targeting, though, um, when used in campaigns, is not quite as negative as what happened during the 2016 election. But it is essentially an undemocratic act that uh, the people who are politicians who are running for office, including me, um, you know, know that what they need, because you can so carefully target your campaign communications solely to the group that you know are either likely voters or likely to uh, give you campaign contributions, uh, everybody else gets left out of the conversation. And you, uh, the purpose of debate the purpose of our elections is so that people can in, get involved in campaigns and can get involved in knowing what the issues are that are important in campaigns. And unfortunately, because this targeting occurs, and particularly when it occurs on the internet, and so the, it gets segmented to different area groups, there's a whole swath of people who are left out of political discussion. Um, and when I was teaching my uh, campaign finance class at Berkeley, uh, I said, I bet, and I just said it randomly, I bet that in East Los Angeles, which is mostly Latino, that they don't get any campaign materials. And it turned out there was a student in the class from East Los Angeles, and he said, that's right. You never, no one ever comes to try to influence our vote. And, you know, the, the whole um, idea of elections is so that people can hear various opinions to make informed decisions. It's part of democratic deliberation, and in fact, um, there's a lot of people, um, now I'll talk about law for a minute, um, <laughs> there are a lot of people who think that there's, uh, and a lot, many have said, there's a constitutional right to hear information as well, particularly in the, in the, uh, in the context of political speech. This Supreme Court probably wouldn't find that to be true, but what happens is with less exposure to these conversations, people are much less likely to vote. And then social media in 2016. There have been a number of studies, both in the Mueller um, indictments, but also there's a professor at Wisconsin, um, uh, Professor Kim, who did a study of, um, she analyzed all the Facebook ads, and sub others have been done since that show that with the micro-targeting that can be done now, which uh, was uh, perfected by Cambridge Analytica, you can not only get all the information from Facebook about yourself, if you are also on an app, uh, related that has a button related to Facebook. Uh, th that information is given. 
all the information that shows up on the internet when you actually um, also uh, email. So <laughs> all of this information people have about you. In fact, Cambridge Analytica said they had about Americans at least 7,000 data points about every American. Um, so they use this information uh, to target certain groups. And in, this, in the 2016 campaign, the groups that were primarily targeted um, for voter suppression were African Americans, and Bernie um, supporters, uh, but primarily African Americans. And there was also a large amount of um, targeting that was done that was just racist and racial to begin with that were emulating some of the other uh, parts of uh, the campaign. But with respect to the African American voters, some of them were like straight out, uh, you know, a fake um, Facebook account called uh, Blacktivist, which really didn't exist, but was trying to emulate Black Lives Matter and appear to be part of a Black Lives Matter um, account. And in fact, they got more hits than Black Lives Matter's actual Facebook account. And in that, they had fake videos, uh, showing Hillary uh, taking actions against uh, African Americans, violent actions, um, other, other kinds of, of false information that were sent to specific people, African Americans in swing states. And the same was done, of course, with um, other groups like gun rights people to sway the election, but they specifically were attempting to uh, stop people from, from uh, voting. And there were many of them that said, um, and I will tell you in the um, Internet Research Agency, there were 10,000 Russian Facebook accounts that told people to not vote. They said, uh, your vote doesn't matter, stay home on election day. And as I said, it was specific to African Americans, Latinos, youth, LGBTQ community, and they reached 126 million Americans. 126 million Americans. And there were also many of the voter suppression more standardized voter suppression um, communications that said things like, um, oh, yes, your uh, voting day is November 1 or something. Or, and to others, they would say, uh, you can tweet, your, you can uh, uh, text your vote, which, of course, we know none of those things is true. So I have about Five, it's so far away, five minutes, but I'll, I'll go quicker, I promise. Um, so I, I, I think that um, what, you, what you will f understand from this is that um, b because of this, uh, both what's called, what I call digital deception, not fake news, um, and the suppression in the 2018 election, uh, many well-regarded people have said that uh, this has actually impacted the vote in this country and that um, there's, there's an article and a book written by Kathleen Hall Jamison, who is a professor at the Annenberg School in Pennsylvania, and she has actually said that you know, by a preponderance of the evidence that the election was altered because of this, um, <laughs> because of this activity, including some other activities. Um, and I, I, in, in, I won't take any more time. And if anybody has questions, but uh, one of the um, 
things that I think we have to realize, and Eric Holder said it, and you know Eric Holder is dealing a lot with issues of, um, you know, whether or not, mostly of redistricting and the like, those are his, that's what his, his issue is about. But he said after the Wisconsin uh, issue, he said, unregulated dark money combined with these voter ID laws, combined with gerrymandering, and so he's grouping them all together, and he said, this is inconsistent with how our nation's system is supposed to be set up, and it is. So, questions? Thank you. Well, Citizens United actually didn't speak to foreign money, and it's a question that is um, debated in campaign finance circles about whether or not, for example, foreign corporations can uh, participate in elections that, so because of, because of Citizens United. And some people think so. I don't think they should be um, under the law but the Supreme Court hasn't weighed in on that issue. I think the real problem is uh, the fact that it is impossible to trace the money. It's very difficult, and it requires a lot of sophistication, and much of the money is now passed through electronically, um, and I, or money that gets, and, and here's, you know, just my, don't, don't quote me on this because it might not come out this way in the uh, indictments, but uh, <laughs> LLCs are a very common way to funnel money. And there are a lot of LLCs in this country where people will set them up solely for the purpose of um, hiding campaign contributions. So that's a long story, but um, foreign money can be funneled through them as well. I'm wondering, intrigued by your criticism of micro-targeting and big data, understand it. I'm wondering if there's anything that could be done about it, though. I'm thinking, yeah. tell me what you think. Absent restrictions on foreign interference or actual deception, right. um, we pretty much have to leave it alone and wouldn't it be okay as long as it was rough, roughly equal ability of all sides to use micro-targeting in big data? Yeah, I, I think that the real um, ultimate uh, resolution to micro-targeting from whether it be domestic or foreign is that first off, I think that the platform should be required to disclose the micro-targeting, and unlike Facebook that now discloses, oh yes, you were targeted because you're a woman, because you go to Macy's and you, you know, buy high-heeled shoes. No. You need to target, you need to say, I was targeted for this because I love to visit Nazi websites, or whatever. You know, it needs to be a lot more precise, so that people can then opt out. That's, it's disclosure that is the answer. Okay, I'm, I've been given the hook. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all.